Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Cloud Tool Time webinar. My name is Samantha, and joining us today, we have Mir Miro Spooneman to discuss developing textual and graphical languages for VS Code and Thea. Miro is a contributing contributor and leader for several open source projects and co-leads Typefox, a company specialized in engineering tools and open source technology. If you have any questions for Miro as we move throughout today's presentation, feel free to ask him in the chat or by using the Ask a Question tab. Without any further delay, Miro, over to you. Thanks a lot, Sam. Yeah, I will start my presentation right away. Uh, just in general, before we get started, I will move my uh, browser window with the Crowdcast uh, content to the side you know, on a different display so that I will try to follow the chat. And so if there are any questions in between, I'll be happy to uh, to uh, answer them also during the presentation. Uh, but of course, it's also fine to address questions at the end. So let me share. Good. So as mentioned, uh, today's session is about textual and graphical languages in the cloud, specifically in VS Code or Thea. So, yeah, um, I work for Typefox, where I do a lot of open source stuff, especially in the tooling area for cloud. And in the past, we've been doing a lot of desktop-based tooling. And so I think we are in really interesting times where it's about a transition uh, from uh, tools that are more focused on desktop uh, uh, technologies and now towards cloud technologies. And this will be a lot of what I'm going to talk about. So first, a look back backwards in time uh, to EclipseCon Europe 2018. Uh, I made a presentation together with Jan Könlein about domain-specific languages in the cloud. And yeah, we'll actually start with a few slides that I just took, uh, took from that presentation and then yeah, address uh, the yeah, what we have been talking about and uh, yeah, see how we can go further from there. So this is one of those slides of 2018. So there we wanted to present a, a DSL tool in, in the browser. So that was the goal that we set out in the beginning. So it should have an intelligent DSL editor, a code generator that creates, in this example, Java code out of the DSL. So DSL stands for domain specific language. So it can be any kind of text language that you design specifically to solve problems in your domain. Then we have automatic validation checks that show errors or warnings for parts of your DSL. Uh, completion, so in the Eclipse context, uh, you may call it content assist in the text editor. A workspace integration uh, where you have your whole file system and, and also tools like Git. And a graphical view that is synchronized with the text. So in this case, the running example is a state machine with states, events, and transitions. And the graphical view is a diagram of that state machine that shows the transitions as arrows or connections between the states. Good. We also drafted an architecture. So the it, will, it shall be a cloud tool. And in the browser, we uh, have the IDE application running on the client side. Uh, it contains a coded ed editor for text and a graphical view connected to it. And then on the server side, we have a language server. So this refers to the language server protocol that has been designed uh, primarily for VS Code, but then also uh, picked up by several other tools. So uh, Thea also has support for that so they, that you can run any VS Code uh, extensions with language servers in as well in Thea. And then there are also many other IDEs that have um, added support for this language server protocol. So it's a very a versatile uh, protocol or, or tool to build on to provide language services to an, a text editor or IDE. So uh, these services can be categorized in text editor or workspace services. And we have a graphics extension that, uh, that takes the information from the language server to derive a text or a graphical representation from that. Now, for the textual part, we built on Xtext. That's a 
very mature project at the Eclipse Foundation that has been proven super useful in many projects. And so we at Typefox has, have done loads of things with that. You can easily create a new project with that. So there's a wizard in the, in the uh, Eclipse IDE uh, that uh, provides you within a language server support right away using LSP4J. That's a library that we also created initially to connect a Java application to the language server protocol. And so the process is then you specify an XTEX grammar. So we will see later what that means and write a code generator to generate uh, some output or target code from that. And then you package that to build a language server to run in your IDE. So this is an example of uh, the grammar that I mentioned. So uh, the actual DSL text is shown on the right hand side. So it's a state machine. So it starts with a keyword state machine followed by a name, then a set of events, each with a name, and the rest is a list of states. And every state has transitions uh, specifying which event they listen to, and then an arrow and the target state. So a very simple language. And on the left-hand side, we see the X text grammar for that. So the main uh, content here is a set of grammar rules that specify the syntax for every uh, every kind of element in this language. Then for the diagram part, we used Sprotty. That's a framework that we started in 2017 with the aim to provide diagramming for the web. It uses TypeScript and SVG for rendering and combined with CSS, you can uh, Yes, set up all the styling, like colors and line styles. So Sprotty has integration uh, support for VS Code uh, and also for Thea. And uh, if you use it together with VS Code, you can also integrate it with the language server protocol so that the actual content of the diagrams can be provided by the language server. Just a quick view on the internal architecture of Sprotty. So this is a view of the front end part, which is running in the browser. So let's start with the viewer. That's the actual rendering component that shows the diagram. So it does that with a virtual DOM framework called SnapDOM. And then the framework picks up events from, from the user interface and dispatches them through a component called Action Dispatcher, which can eventually transform these events into commands that are executed on the command stack to transform the internal model. So, and that's how we react to user events like uh, clicking, scrolling with a mouse. And in that way, using this virtual DOM framework, we have a very fast and responsive user interaction. Then to, to actually provide the model, we use the language server protocol in this example. So that's not the only way to, how you can do that in Sprotty, but uh, today we are sticking to that. And on the server side, we have the language server running that includes a so-called diagram server that is responsible for creating the diagram content. And the diagram content is generated uh, using a diagram generator component. And so it picks up the, uh, the parse result of the DSL and transforms that or generates that into a diagram content model. Let's have a quick demo of how that looked like. So this, uh, the demo I'm, I'm going to show is based on the Sprotty VS Code repository. So you can find it in GitHub slash Eclipse slash Sprotty dash VS Code. And so this is the main VS Code integration code for Sprotty. There used to be, or there is also a Thea integration code, but uh, that, uh, just, just as a side comment here, that uh, Thea integration code no longer has direct access to the language server because that used an API of Thea that is no longer supported. And that's why when we interact with the language server, we now have to stick with this Sprotty VS Code integration. So it means you have to, uh, to use the VS Code extension format to package your language servers in Thea. Good, so let's start and I can select a launch configuration for Xtext that, so now uh, this is running in Gitpod, an online IDE uh, that runs VS Code in the browser. And now we see an example uh, uh, state machine 
And uh, the editor support here is provided by Xtext. So let's see, for example, when I select the target state here, it automatically highlights the definition of that state. I can also command click on it and the cursor jumps to it. I can search for references and I can see uh, them all. I can rename by pressing F2. And uh, yeah, if I just write anything uh, that is not available, it marks uh, an error here. And uh, by doing control space, I get content assist. So, so I can uh, select one of the, of the other states. Well, here you see there's another extension interfering with me, tab nine. It's a quite useful extension actually, but maybe not so useful in this context. Good, and then I can right click here and open this in a diagram. And this will transform this textual model into a diagram model. And now I have a Sprotty diagram here that I can uh, that I can view. And this is synchronized with the text. So if I put a, 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 um, type F2 again to rename this, we'll see the changes directly in, uh, with a very short delay. Or I can change this to, to another target state. And so the structure of the, uh, of the state machine will be updated very quickly. Good, so that's the kind of application that we aimed for in this presentation that I mentioned 2018. So let's have another look at the, at the architecture of that solution. We have a browser IDE application written in TypeScript. And so the technology stack and all the tools that we use there are uh, NPM, Yarn, Webpack. Then we integrate all of this in VS Code or Thea. Uh, we need Node.js for the back-end parts of those uh, of those IDEs and React for some of the front-end parts. So that's kind of the web technology stack that we use in that context. While on the server part, we have the language server written in Xtext. And in that context, we need tools like Maven or Gradle to build and package the whole thing. We have to develop this in e Eclipse IDE. So uh, I mean, usually a Java application can also be developed in other IDEs, of course, but in this case, we use Xtext, uh, and which has a special integrations with Eclipse. And so uh, normally you would uh, do all that in Eclipse IDE to make use of those special integrations. Uh, then Xtext builds on EMF, the Eclipse modeling framework, which is a very powerful tool to build modeling applications. And in some parts, it, we may use Extend as an alternative programming language, which is based on Java. It's uh, Extend is super nice. It's a language uh, created in the context of Xtext and has features like uh, very nice multi-line expression, template expression strings, where you can um, have very powerful replacement of variables, even with loop and conditionals. So far, so good. but. Here we see we, that we have two very separate and incompatible technology stacks, which is okay, it works, and you can build all of this. But in my experience, it's a potential risk because it's it's not so easy actually to find a, a team of developers that is proficient in all of these technologies. And so I see a, a risk about high costs of development and maintenance, at least in the long run. So because you need to maintain these two code bases or these two parts of your tool code base. And so there are even more ways how the whole application could break. Yes, yeah, so you, could, you could run into problems regarding dependencies on the, on the NPM side or on the Java side. And so the more technologies you use and combine, the more fragile the whole thing becomes, at least in my experience. And so, uh, the experience that I've made with these technology stacks is it is possible. We made it that way four years ago and it is, it's fine, but it's not exactly the nicest way to work, actually, to be honest. And so as we started to realize this uh, more and more, we, uh, we got ideas about doing something new. And that's where the idea of a new uh, language toolkit 
uh, was created. And uh, now it, it, it also has a name, Langium. So it's a new uh, project, open source project that we started about a year ago. And the first version was published in June 2021. And the main property of this new framework is it's based on TypeScript. So the same technology stack that we use for Sprotty or VS Code and Theorem. So one of the main thoughts that we had was uh, let's keep the tried and tested. So the those things that made Xtext a great framework and that made it really successful. And most of all, the grammar language, which is the entry point that you use to design your syntax. And we have already seen an example of that. And also the concept of cross-references where you can reference symbols within your DSL. And I've already showed that with the transitions and their target states. Uh, also related to cross-references uh, are the concepts about scoping and indexing, which are the internal processes that ensure that the linking is is done between a cross-reference at some one point in your text file and the corresponding symbol that is referenced in, in some other part of your text file or even in another file. So you could have a whole workspace of, of documents that reference each other. And uh, also dependency injection is a concept that was used in Xtext and now also in Langium to wire everything together. So to connect a large set of services with, with each other and that enables you to do fine-grained customization by replacing specific parts of the framework with your custom implementation. On the other hand, we had the idea to remove the stumbling blocks. So those parts where we thought it works, but in most cases, uh, we think we can do it uh, in a simpler way. And uh, one part of those is uh, affects the types of the data structure that we get out of the parser of the parsing process. In Xtext, we use the Eclipse modeling framework, uh, which is great in many use cases. But uh, actually, in the in many of the projects that we have done with uh, with languages, it was not really necessary to have a whole full fledged modeling framework in the background where we just need some data structure to, to process on validation and, and code generation. And so in Langion, we decided to rely purely on the built-in type system of TypeScript. And so here we see an example of such a type that is generated from a Langion grammar. So interface state has a meta property starting with dollar that connects a single state with its container. In that case, it's a state machine. Then it has the user-defined properties like actions, which are references to some um, commands, or the name of the state and transitions, which are uh, which is an array of the transitions contained in the state. Another part that we found we could uh, simplify is uh, how we generate the necessary code out of an instance of the grammar language. In Xtext, we use the, a workflow engine, while in Langium, we try to follow the, uh, the defaults or the, the standard way how you usually interact with tools in the NPM and Node context, and that's by using command line interfaces. And so Langium ships a command line interface, a CLI, that can process a grammar file and writes output code from that. So that can be some TypeScript code or also a JSON file uh, that specifies the uh, the syntax for syntax highlighting that is used in the front end. And finally, another part that we could uh, uh, greatly simplify is uh, we don't need a um, a custom made library to uh, to uh, transform the JSON messages of the um, language server protocol into uh, the into data structures. Because that, that's what we did in Xtext. We uh, created LSP4J as a connector between the language server protocol and the actual language server implementation. And the problem is that the language server protocol is actually designed for TypeScript. You may think that it's a general protocol, uh, but if you really try to implement that in Java, you uh, quite quickly get into, into special cases that are really hard to realize in Java because 
the types system of TypeScript is not really compatible with that of Java. And in Langion, we uh, rely on the VS Code language server NPM package that is shipped by Microsoft. And that's kind of the reference implementation of the language server protocol. So here we are really sure that everything is compatible with the latest version of the protocol and there are no issues on the language barrier. So let's see an example of a grammar uh, using uh, the same state machine language that we've seen before. And this is very similar to what we've already seen with Xtext. So it, it's a grammar declaration with a set of states. And one difference is, uh, in this example, it's uh, basically the only difference, that the first rule has an additional keyword entry. So we call it the entry rule. And that's the one that will be used by the parser as in the initial state when it starts parsing an input document. So it assumes that every document starts with a state machine keyword in this example. Then we have keywords like here state machine or also state further below. Assignments are instructions to the parser to, uh, to uh, consume a token ID, an identifier in this case and then assign that value to a property name. And this is a property of the state machine object that, in which, uh, which is currently being processed. We have multiplicities like here a star means zero or more. So it can be many states here. And the plus equal is a special case uh, of an assignment that adds an element to an array. So it's like a pushing to an array in JavaScript. And finally, on the last line, we see the state being used with surrounding square brackets. And this is the notation for cross-references. It's the same in Xtext, and so we took over that syntax. So it means that a transition has a reference to a state that is defined elsewhere, in the, either in the same file or in another file. So let's have a quick look at how it works internally. So an input file is first fed into the parser and uh, we didn't invent the wheel again. We just use a very good parser library that is also implemented in TypeScript called Chevrotain. Uh, that parsing process is separated in two phases. First, tokenizing means taking a stream of characters and producing a stream of tokens out of that. And the parser itself then takes that token stream and produces a, um, a data structure called abstract syntax tree or AST. And that's the basis for all further pro processing. So we take the AST, we uh, put it through indexing where we collect all the symbols in the data structure to make them available for referencing. We link all the cross references and then call custom validation rules uh, to yeah, to generate errors and warnings as necessary. And, and so that these can be shown directly in the text editor later on. Here we see an example of such, such an abstract syntax tree. So it uh, doesn't contain the full set of elements that we see in the text, so it's just a subset, um, but it has a root node, in this case, a state machine. And the root node contains a set of events and a set of states. Uh, the states then in turn have transitions. And for example, the idle state that we see here and is defined here in the left side has one transition door closed to active two. And so this transition element in the AST has two cross references. In the grammar we have seen before, by the way, I have left out those, uh, uh, those events just for simplicity. So the transition here has a cross reference to the event door closed and another cross reference to the state active two. And so this AST is now the basis for doing all sorts of uh, processing. We can use this for an, an interpreter that is able to live interpret the content of the DSL, or we can feed that into a compiler or transpiler, or, or you can call also call it code generator. So to generate any kind of target code out of this. Now, uh, when in the example we've seen before, we uh, the assumption was that from every rule 
in the grammar, we automatically infer types that we uh, that we can use then to pro to do further processing. And so, for example, a state machine uh, rule infers a state machine type, and a state rule infers a state type, and so on. And the uh, the properties of those types are exactly corresponding to the assignments that we have written in the in the grammar. And this works very well, especially for rapid prototyping. So in the initial phase, when you design a language, you want to move forward quickly and very, uh, really focus on the syntax. And from that, then we automatically derive a structure. So the, uh, the syntax uh, by writing rules and uh, defining those rules uh, using the grammatic elements, then um, induces a structure of the resulting AST. Now, when a language pro um, project becomes more mature, it's at some point it will be no longer really feasible to always infer that structure because we, at some point, we want to uh, declare these AST types explicitly to make sure that they will be stable and that there will be no accidental changes to those because a lot of the of the following code base will depend on that, like as I mentioned, validation and code gener generators and so on. And so that's why we introduced a new syntax to define types. So, and when you write a rule name like state returns and then a type name, it means that we refer to an explicitly declared type. type and the syntax for that is actually almost the same as in TypeScript. So you can define an interface state. And now this return type state here is a reference to this interface state. So in this case, the rule name and the type name are the same, but there are also cases where that can be different. Like when you have multiple rules that return the same type, for example. Uh, one difference to TypeScript is uh, in for cross-references, which is a special thing in Langium. And here we use the at symbol as a notion to, to say that uh, this state here is a cross-reference. And so here on the type level, we see, for example, states is an array of state and transitions is an array of transition and so on. And these are mentions or usages of other types. While on the rule level, when we here we say that we want to parse a state, it's a reference to the, uh, to the parser rule state. And so we have two different levels. One is the level of rule calls and one is the level of type usages. And this is very similar to how many programming languages work, in particular TypeScript itself. So if we look at TypeScript code, there is a type scope, like uh, the return type of a function, for example, refers to some type. And that can even be the same name as the function type itself. So there is no conflict because it, the function is in the value scope. So you can use the function in your code directly. So like here, we, I can reference that function. And so there is no conflict because value scope and type scope are separate in TypeScript. And that's very similar to how the grammar language work, works. Uh, yeah, by the way, I won't go into more detail on that, but this is a, a pseudocode that I made uh, that shows uh, roughly how the parser works. So how it interprets the, the grammar that we have uh, written before, like by consuming a state machine keyword uh, consuming an identifier, assigning it to the name, and so on. But let's move forward for now. So here we have the same base architecture as we have seen before with Langium uh, or with Sproti plus Xtext. The difference is that now the language server is also built based on TypeScript. So we have the IDE application with the TypeScript code for the text editor, graphical view, and all your IDE specific uh, adaptations. The language server protocol in the middle, and then on the server side, a language server implemented in Langium and all based on TypeScript. So there's now a coherent and consistent technology stack. And this is the main thing uh, why I think it's really useful, especially now in the cloud era, to uh, use something that that allows you to build in a whole tool stack within a, a certain technology area like uh, the the web technology stack 
when we have a look at the um, at the actual graphics extension, so this is basically the same concept as we had that with Xtext. So within the language server, we have an extension for providing the graphics. Uh, so and this is a rough overview of how that works. The client, the uh, which contains the text editor, uh, constantly ch sends change notifications to the server. So these are sent as JSON RPC messages, and Langium processes these notifications in the so-called document builder. Then in our diagram extension, we listen to these uh, build and update events, and whenever a change is notified, we regenerate the diagram model. So it, it's uh, the component has the same name as before. It's a diagram generator. It takes an AST of your language and transforms that into a diagram model. And this new diagram model is then fed into a diagram server, which is a backend component that corresponds to one client diagram instance. So one diagram server component instance for every client diagram instance. And that submits this new model to the client to show it. Let's see how this looks like. And as you may expect, the functionality is actually the same as we have been seen before. So it's uh, another launch configuration in our Sproti VS Code repository. And we, again, we have the same DSL example. I can still So follow cross references. I can still right click, find all references, and rename things. And I have content assist here that shows me all the states that I can uh, that I can select, and I can right click and open a diagram to see a diagram representation for this. And yeah, here I can navigate this in Langium and. If I change something here, oh no, that's uh, that's an event, so I have to take a state. So if I change something here, we see the immediate reaction of the diagram that shows the updated state machine. Good. Now, uh, as the final part, I'd like to show how can you get started uh, with this new technology stack. So I have already presented uh, about uh, Langium or also other technologies involved here like, uh, like Thea in previous presentations, uh, also in part also years ago, like the one I mentioned before. But how do you get started with, uh, with Langium? We created a a project generator using a quite popular tool in the NPM space called Yeoman. So the first step is to install a Yeoman or uh, called the package is called Yo and generate a Langium uh, in your NPM. So NPM install global uh, for these two packages. And then Yo Langium calls the project generator and then you can use that. Let's try it. So I will skip the installation part because that is already done. So I just do yo langium. And here I have to answer three questions about the name of the extension I want to create. Here we'll just take the proposed default, which is creating a hello world language. Then the name of the language itself and the file extensions that will be associated with uh, documents of that language. So now I created a set of files. Next step is to run the npm build. So this is now uh, downloading all the necessary dependencies and then running the TypeScript compiler. And then I can open the resulting project in VS Code. You could also use Thea if you want. And okay, and then we have that. And I can run that right away. So it has a built-in launch configuration and let's create a test file with extension hello. And here I see I can write either a hello keyword or person keyword.
And now if I do hello, I see I have two persons defined and I can select which person to read. So this is the hello world example, which already includes a cross-reference. So the example itself is, is a minimal example, of course, otherwise it wouldn't be hello world. It, well, I think you could imagine even more minimal grammar examples, but uh, this one has the advantage that it features a cross-reference so, uh, so that you see how it works. So we have a person and a greeting. So this is the Langium grammar file in the source language server uh, folder. What else is here? There's also the generated code. So this is what the Langium CLI creates. Whenever I change something in the uh, the Langium source file, I have to regenerate uh, the. I have to regenerate the uh, using the Langium CLI. I can do that by doing npm run Langium colon generate. So that's a script that is specified in the package JSON, and that's very fast. So it just processes the input file and then says here are the output files. And let's have a quick look at the AST, for example. So this is generated code using, that has the, all the types, as I mentioned before, uh, using interface declarations with the properties uh, that are mentioned in the grammar, like here, person. Uh, so that's the a reference to the person of a greeting. And the model has a, an array of greetings and an array of persons, and so on. Then we have an extension.ts which is the, uh, the VS Code extension integration. So it, which in this case, it just integrates the language server with VS Code. So it's just a standard VS Code extension code. And that is uh, part of this generated project. And yeah, just because it's useful so that you can get started earlier. And a CLI that can be used to, uh, to, uh, to generate target code. So in this case, there's a, a, an example generator that prints out uh, JavaScript code for your source language. So and you can use this as a basis to build your own command line interfaces that either generate some kind of code or interpret your input models and do something with that. And yeah, that's it. So all the rest is just um, project setup and, and VS Code integration stuff. Now, Mira, we have some questions in the chat, so I thought we'd get to those before you continue on. Uh, the yeah. first question is, is the graphical extension that was mentioned different from the Eclipse graphical language server platform? The, uh, so it means different from the GLSP. Um, well, so the GLSP project is uh, actually building on top of Sproti. And uh, so it's it actually yeah I think it provides a bit of a different um, abstraction level. So the GLSP, as I understand it, is really meant to build a modeling tool, where the, uh, the where the graphical model is your primary input. And so I think it is also possible f to combine a GLSP with uh, which builds on Sproti uh, together with a textual language. Uh, honestly, I haven't done that yet, but it would be an interesting experience. And usually my approach is to use text as the primary input. So, so text is really the driver here. It means uh, you, uh, we put most of the effort in our projects into designing a really nice textual language. And uh, so all the, the models are stored in that DSL format. And uh, yeah, and then we can derive other representations from that, like a, a diagram, for example, or even other kinds of, uh, of representations. So you could also imagine an additional view in your IDE, like an additional widget that uh, displays some information in a table, for example. And uh, so by using, so the important thing is you have to decide what is your primary input. So what is uh, the the main thing that your users will have to deal with. And uh, then you can derive other things from that. 
I, what I would not recommend is trying to make a tool that has two, um, two equivalent input methods that uh, that you so like for example uh, offering both a text uh, input and graphics uh, editing in input um, on the same uh, on the, like putting them on the same level for the users because that is usually quite a lot of effort to do that uh, so both on the uh, when for the first implementation and also for long term maintenance Wonderful. And the next question is, how is the editor state, e.g. node locations, maintained? When a change notification comes in, is the existing diagram model updated incrementally or completely created anew? So the, um, the state of the document itself is managed in the language server. So the change notifications are sent by the client incrementally. So they so the client can just send a delta saying uh, there was um, yeah, adding, just like saying add these new characters at position this and that in the document. And so the language server can then update its internal state on that and, and provide a new text. But the uh, the diagram that is, uh, that is derived from that is always regenerated from scratch. And the main reason for that is that it's uh, so much easier to implement a, a, a unidirectional transformation from your AST into a, a diagram model format than trying to um, to have both states and then trying to, to uh, have incremental updates on that. I'm sure it is somehow possible, but in my experience, it's not worth the effort because this transformation process that uh, traverses the AST of your language and then produces a data structure for the diagram that is usually so fast that it's not really worth the effort of uh, maintaining and uh, or trying to up incrementally update the, uh, the state of the diagram. So what it does is really creating the diagram from scratch and sending the updated state to the to the front end and then the front end a rendering component that takes care of up making only the the minimal updates in the browser uh, to avoid any unnecessary overhead and that's what i mentioned before using the snap dom uh, virtual dom library that, that is taking care of that so that's nothing that is implemented specifically for uh, for sprody great okay so our next question is is it right that a major functional difference from the user point of view between the Xtext LSP generator and Langium is that the TextMate grammar is generated automatically out of the language grammar as Xtext cannot do this? Uh, yeah, just a second. I was just distracted because I just uh, saw that the questions are in a different, shown in a different pen uh, compared to the normal chat. So that's why I didn't see the questions before. Okay, so it's, is it right that a major uh, functional difference between Xtext and Langium is that the text made grammars generated automatically out of the language? Um, yes, Xtext doesn't have a built-in generator for the, uh, for the text made grammar that is used for syntax highlighting. Um, but actually this um, text made generator is quite simple and uh, usually, and you can, it's also optional. So it is active by default in the beginning, but usually I would use it in the rapid prototyping phase and at some point disable that automatic generator and maintain the text made grammar manually because uh, there are uh, will, for more complex cases, there will be certainly situations where you have to fine tune the text made syntax yourself. Um, that's one major functional difference, yes. But uh, I also mentioned other differences like uh, not having a, a modeling framework in Langium and also using a CLI to generate the code instead of uh, the uh, workflow engine and so on. Okay, great. Now there are two other questions. However, we can save those for the end and let you continue your presentation. 
And uh, well, actually, this is already the last slide, so we can oh. go to, to the other questions. Fantastic then. So the next question is, does the Langham plus Sporati integration support editing operations like in the X text based state machine example? Um, in the current state, it doesn't have those. Um, but there is there, there's nothing that stands uh, conceptually against doing that. So it's really just a matter of doing because the so the previous example maybe I can just show it uh, that was based on X text also featured a few editing operations. And um, I haven't tested this now, but so basically you can create new states, for example, uh, and also new events, and then I can connect the, uh, the states. And so this actually leads to changes in the text. So here we see a new state, state zero at the end. And uh, yeah, and this is now connected to the waiting for draw state so the way how this was implemented on the x text base uh, based um uh, yeah, diagram implementation was by using the uh, existing concept of uh, um, code actions in the language server so code actions are a, a yeah one kind of request in the language server protocol where the client asks the server to provide uh, actions that can be done on the code and for this example, what we did here is to provide these kind of code actions, like adding a new state or a new event. And uh, so this, uh, um, these buttons that, that we saw here in the editor, which have a bit of ugly styling currently, uh, did nothing else but just invoking these code actions. And so it would be very easy to implement these same code actions also on the langium based implementation. So the API for that is there. It's just that it's not been done yet for this specific example. So, and, and this, by the way, is of course very different from the how it would work if you use a uh, something like GLSP, uh, which uh, gives you first class support for editing. So that's uh, that would be more in the direction of a modeling tool then. While here we have a graphical representation connected to a textual representation. And so the idea is to, to implement as much of, as possible of, of any interaction that you can make uh, via the existing language server. So for example, code actions. All right, and the last question I see in the chat is, if you have a project on the old tech stack, X text grammar, EMF, workflow engine, LSP4J, Java, would it be worthwhile to migrate to Langium? To me, it sounds like quite a large migration effort. Yeah, I think it depends a lot on uh, on the state of that um, of that existing project. So if you rely heavily on EMF or have very large uh, code base, uh, like with large um, code generators written in uh, for X text, or maybe even an extend, uh, that is that would actually mean doing a lot of re-implementation work. And so the question whether it's uh, it's worth the effort to migrate is not easy to um, to answer. In many cases, you probably not. It, uh, unless you have uh, a real pain that uh, you to, to do so. Um, in general, I, I would actually like to uh, to build something like a migration tool or a migration helper at some point. I think that's something that uh, uh, I or, or maybe others fr from my team are going to work on so that can take an existing x text project and uh, take into consideration all the grammar files and also EMF models that you have, and then transform that into a more or less equivalent Langium project. But of course, uh, we won't do any automatic transformation of Java code to TypeScript. So that's uh, certainly out of scope. So the actual implementation uh, will still need, need a, uh, that's something you need to do by hand. And uh, 
that's yes, that's a quite large migration effort. So the main target for this new framework, I would say, is for new projects. All right. Well, there's currently no other questions in the chat. So, Mir, if you'd like, I will do a quick wrap up of everything. That way we can get everyone on their way. But I wanted to thank you so much for that wonderful presentation today. And just a reminder for anyone in the audience, if you have any final questions, feel free to ask them in the chat or in the questions tab. I'll give you a few seconds while I wrap up everything else. Uh, as always, we are always looking to book more Cloud Cool Time webinars throughout 2022. So if you're interested in presenting, feel free to fill out the form, which I've just added into the chat. There we go. Perfect. And let's see if any other questions have come in. And by the way, the website mentioned here, langium.org, already has... Uh quite some documentation. So it's not complete yet, but uh, we're, we're working on that. And so I think it's already in, in a good shape to get started. Spectacular. All right, well, if there are no other questions, then I will say thank you to Miro again. This was a fantastic presentation and thank you to everyone attended as well as asked questions. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks a lot, Sam. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.